and persevering and exploring the, uh, our uh, neighbor, neighboring planet together, but being explorers together uh, and persevering. And so for me, that image is just uh, uh, really one of those uh, uh, demonstrations. No, this is not fake. That's exactly what happened last night. That's exactly what happened next night in uh, Switzerland and for the next uh, few nights. So I just really want to uh, thank Jerry Hofstetter, uh, the artist and event designer who did that, and uh, uh, of course Daniel Lucken, uh, who is uh, who is uh, the official in charge who enabled that. There's a lot of people who had to agree to that moment of coming together. I can say that I be able to thank you thank you for the for the Yes, that was Swiss German, and I do speak that language. With that, however, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Uh, uh, you know, and I just want to tell you. Uh, uh, how much I appreciate Matt and his work and, and the work of his entire team. Uh, Matt and I got to know each other a lot because we too had to persevere together. Matt. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm not going to speak German, but I'm pretty excited. Uh, this is the fifth Mars rover mission I've had an opportunity to work on. And uh, I have to say this one's really special um, for, for a lot of reasons, some of which you've already heard about. Uh, that we're doing transformative science really for the first time we're looking for signs of life on another planet and uh, as, as Thomas mentioned for the first time we're going to collect samples that will be part of we hope the first sample return from another planet and uh, there's a lot of other firsts along the way um, administrator mentioned our first powered uh, aerial capability uh, with the Ingenuity helicopter uh, we're making oxygen on the surface of Mars uh, for the first time. Uh, for the first time, we have an opportunity to use autonomous systems to uh, avoid hazards on uh, as we land in Jezero Crater, and that's a technology that will feed forward into future robotic systems and human exploration systems, uh, and that's exciting. We're also carrying microphones for the first time. We're going to hear the sounds of the spacecraft landing on another planet and the, and the uh, rover uh, drilling in the rocks and, and rolling over the surface of, of Mars. And, uh, you know, that, that's pretty exciting. And I'll mention one more, which is uh, kind of near and dear to my heart. For the first time, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to see another spacecraft, see our spacecraft land on another planet. Uh, we've got commercial ruggedized cameras that we've distributed essentially all over the spacecraft. And, uh, and they'll get high-definition video that we'll bring back after we land on the surface of the entire landing activity from the inflation of the parachute to the touchdown of the rover. And uh, that's going to be some very exciting footage. So, uh, so the whole, whole mission is um, uh, very exciting for me. If we bring up the first graphic, just from a, a quick historical perspective, we, um, we really began to look for ways to leverage the powerful Sky, sky crane delivery system that we developed to successfully land Curiosity and Gale Crater in 2012. Uh, we, we started to look for that opportunity almost immediately after we launched Curiosity in 2011. We got a new start on the project in 2012. Um, we had uh, our instruments selected by mid-2014 and then we got down to work accommodating those mission, those, uh, those uh, in, uh, instruments and, and experiments and started building, uh, still started building the uh, vehicle. Along the way, we had plenty of challenges. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we had to qualify a new planetary parachute. That's uh, another first, first time we've done that as an agency in uh, 40 or 50 years. It's not an easy thing to do. It requires a lot of, uh, number of suborbital rocket flights out of wallops. Uh, we, we managed to get that done, and, and we got through a number of other uh, challenges in our development as well. Uh, kind of late in the game, we were asked to accommodate uh, this this uh, little thing called uh, the Mars helicopter. And uh, as you can see, it was well after most of the payloads were assigned to the project. And so, you know, we had to do a little bit of a magic trick to get that one <laughs> on the rover. Uh, we pulled a bit of a rabbit out of the hat, but I guess it was fate uh, because uh, we managed to get it done. And the uh, helicopter team delivered their system, and it's uh, sitting up with the Perseverance rover on top of our Atlas V rocket, uh, getting ready to go to Mars with us. So uh, you all know the launch is coming up. And of course, there's about a six and a half month cruise uh, to Mars, and we'll land the middle of February of 2021 at Jezero Crater. 
Uh, so if you go to the next uh, graphic, please. Okay, this is, uh, this is the important part. <laughs> this is where I talk about the team. Uh, this is just a small fraction of the team, believe it or not. Uh, this is just the JPL team, and it's just a fraction of the more than 2,000 people over the course of the mission development that worked on the project at JPL. And of course, our team didn't stop at JPL. Pretty much every NASA center participated in this project in one form or another. It was really a cross-agency uh, uh, effort and, and something we're extremely appreciative of all the support that we got. And it didn't stop there. Uh, Thomas mentioned we have three instruments from Europe, one from France, one from Spain, uh, one from Norway, and of, co of course we have a very large science team. I think it's more than 250 uh, scientists really from around the world which are participating in this, in this project uh, as well. Um, if you bring up the next graphic, I think we've got a picture here of the spacecraft. As, uh, I like it because it gives you a sense of the complexity of this system. You see the crew stage up on top. The rover is a little hard to see, but you can see one of the wheels there. And the helicopter is actually mounted underneath uh, the body of the rover. And they're both nestled up into the, uh, uh, into the upper portion of the entry capsule. And we're about to bring the heat shield uh, up to encapsulate the entire spacecraft. This is right before going into our integrated flow with the launch vehicle just a few weeks ago. You know, you can't build something this complex without a lot of uh, help from our industry partners, and they stepped up uh, big time. We uh, built flight hardware in 44 out of the 50 states uh, in the country, more than 550 different cities and towns and communities. Uh, so uh, no matter where you are in this country, uh, you don't have to go very far probably to find somebody that's been part of this mission. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a tremendous uh, team, team effort. Um, you know, it's, uh, we work with um, cutting edge technology, and when we do that, we expect to be, we expect to be challenged. Uh, and as, as Thomas and the administrator have mentioned, our, our fundamental job is to explore new, new places, places we haven't been, uh, answer questions we don't know the answers to, sometimes uh, create questions that we, we didn't even know we needed to ask. Uh, and so you expect new issues and new problems, uh, I have to say, along the way. Uh, but, but really, uh, nothing prepared us uh, for what we had to deal with in, in the middle of March uh, as a pandemic struck. And not just uh, our team, but obviously communities across the country and, and the world. Um, we really, uh, at that point of the mission, we are in our final assembly activities. It's critically important that the team uh, do that assembly correctly, uh, that they do it without making mistakes or damaging the hardware. There's really no safety net at that point. We're working with a very limited schedule every, every day, every shift, uh, every hour <laughs> is, is something we're scrutinized to make sure we're going to stay on track because we got a 20-day planetary launch window, and if we miss it, we're, we're going to push out by a couple years. And so, um, you know, just having the, uh, uh, the coronavirus issue uh, at, at that point in time was, was very challenging for us. Um, and of course, no matter how many hardships we were facing, there's a community set of uh, community out there, first responders, nurses, doctors, and medical community that uh, were, were really facing uh, uh, life and death situations uh, at, at the same time. And so, I asked the team a couple months ago uh, to do something to uh, uh, kind of represent um, this, this particular challenge that we all faced here in 2020 on this mission. And I think if you bring up the next, uh, the next graphic, you can see um, a technician on our assembly team uh, installing a plate. This is on the, a uh, little hard to tell, but it's on the aft port side left side of the rover, uh, and we call the plate the Perseverance uh, COVID-19 plate. Uh, and there's a good good shot of it. Uh, the, you can see we have uh, a representation of the Earth on the top, uh, kind of to symbolize the, the challenge that we faced uh, 
you know, globally as, as the pandemic struck. We have a representation of the spacecraft uh, leaving the Earth and heading to, heading to Mars. And of course, all of this is appropriately supported by the rod and serpent of the medical community. Uh, you know, during this period, uh, this, this is a group of, uh, of, of people that really inspired, I think, our team to keep going. Uh, and, um, and we hope that in some small way this mission can help uh, inspire the people that have had to go through this pandemic as well. So uh, uh, if we go to the next graphic, please. I mentioned uh, the team. You saw some pictures. Uh, our team actually doesn't end with international contributions and industry partners and, and other NASA centers. Uh, we include we include all of you uh, as well. And this plate, if you look at the top uh, left corner of, of this plate, you'll see three small um, microfish chips, which uh, Thomas referred to. These are the places where his family's names and uh, 11 million other names are etched onto those microfish chips. We had only intended to fly one, <laughs> but we got so much interest, we couldn't fit it on one, so we flew three. And you see on the plate as well, representation of the solar system with Earth and Mars, and, uh, and there is some, uh, uh, some hidden Morse code, I think, in the rays of the sun, which people quickly recognized, uh, spelled out, explore as one, which is what we, uh, what we intend to do. You know, we're going to launch uh, the vehicle here in just a, a couple days. And um, uh, we're looking forward to having everybody come along for the ride. If you go to uh, nasa.gov, be my guest, you'll find plenty of experiences uh, there to, to uh, 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 see the launch and to see some of the behind the, behind the scenes uh, interviews. Uh, also at uh, mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020. Uh, there's, uh, if you click on the participate, there's opportunities to get to some pretty cool uh, social media filters. There's a, there's a photo booth there where you can take a picture with uh, the Mars Perseverance rover <laughs> uh, and some, some competitions and some other things. So we invite all of you to ride shotgun along with us starting on Thursday. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our launch director, Omar Baez. Thank you, Matt. And uh, as everybody else here has, has mentioned, um, our, our situation did change. Um, I would have never thought that um, a launch director would be working from home. Um, and I've done that for the last um, uh, five months. And uh, we used to have something called, uh, every other year here, called uh, Take Your Kids to Work. Well, guess what? Every day was take your kids to work day. And uh, I bet you it's been an experience uh, for the kids. Uh, but it's humbling uh, as a parent to see how our whole team, um, from the range to our partners at JPL, to our partners um, uh, ULA, to our folks at headquarters, how we all had to adjust um, to work in this environment and to collaborate el electronically where um, before it was a face-to-face -face interaction versus, you know, seeing somebody's little picture on a uh, computer screen and voice. And uh, even um, as simple as a launch readiness review, which we had this morning, uh, where, where it would have been shoulder to shoulder, that room would have been full and people standing up in the back um, sparse sparse settings, everybody wearing a mask. You had trouble hearing some people because you're wearing these masks. So it, it, there's a challenge uh, and a penalty that goes with doing these things. And uh, I've seen the team react and overcome all of that. And it makes me very proud. Um, and here we are, um, a couple of days from launch. Uh, we did complete the launch readiness review. Um, if I could uh, have the folks roll a, a short video here, I'll show you how we're going to get uh, uh, Perseverance to the Red Planet. And it starts with that right there. That's the Atlas V um, with its RD-180 motors being stacked into the MLP at the uh, VIF at Complex 41. 
Um, that's a, um, SRMs going up. We're flying four of them on this mission, and that gives uh, the Atlas that extra oomph it needs to leave uh, the Earth's gravity well with uh, perseverance and ingenuity. And there you see um, about the last time we got to see the uh, rover and helicopter stack before it got encapsulated. And we took that out to Complex 41 on the uh, 7th and uh, stacked it on top of the vehicle, got it ready. Um, environmentally, um, for uh, planetary protection purposes, we had to uh, prepare that area to be able to ingress and egress. And uh, on the 24th of this month, we um, inserted the RTG, which is going to power the rover on uh, Mars for the next couple of years. And uh, it, we finished out all our testing, and all that remains is I have three goes to go. Tomorrow at 8 in the morning, I give the go for the vehicle to roll out. Um, we take a day of rest after tomorrow to get synced up with having to come in at 2 or 3 in the morning, I give a, a go to uh, fuel the vehicle. And once we're ready and the spacecraft's configured, one more go. And uh, four minutes later, we're going to be flying to Mars. And that makes my job really simple. And over to Tori to explain the rest of it. All right. Thank you, Omar. Um, I cannot tell you how thrilled we are to lift Perseverance. ULA and its Heritage rockets have taken every U.S. mission to Mars. But this one is arguably the most sophisticated, in some ways the most exciting of all of them. So it will sit atop our mighty atlas in the 541 configuration. I like to call that one the dominator because that is our second most powerful atlas. So supplementing that core with its 860,000 pounds of thrust from the RD-180 will be four massive solid rocket motors that you saw in Omar's video, each of them generating another 280,000 pounds of thrust. This rocket is going to leap off the pad with this relatively tiny payload, so do not blink when they say ignition. Now I've got a mission profile video to show you that will just kind of walk through what that flight will look like. If you could run that, please. Three, two. One, main engine start, zero, and liftoff of the Atlas V. The Atlas V RD-180 main engine and four solid rocket boosters ignite to generate more than 10.2 million newtons, or 2.3 million pounds of thrust, to lift the rocket on its way towards a hyperbolic escape trajectory. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the dynamic pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 35 seconds. Following burnout, the four SRBs are jettisoned at 1 minute 49 seconds. In the next two and a half minutes of first stage flight, the Atlas V will more than triple its velocity. Three minutes, 27 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. At four minutes, 22 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down. The Atlas V is now traveling at more than 21,680 kilometers, or 13,470 miles per hour, and located nearly 156 kilometers, or 97 miles in altitude, and 497 kilometers, or 309 miles downrange. Six seconds later, the Atlas Centaur separation system activates to release the booster stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 5% of what it did at liftoff. Ten seconds later, the first burn of the Centaur main engine begins. Burning liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, the Centaur is attaining orbital velocity. At approximately 11 and a half minutes into flight, cutoff of the Centaur main engine, or MECO-1, occurs. The mission now enters a 30-minute coast phase in preparation for the Earth escape burn. The Centaur main engine is restarted at 45 minutes. This burn provides the required thrust for Centaur to escape Earth orbit. Approximately eight minutes later, final cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs. This completes powered flight. 
Centaur will coast for nearly five minutes in preparation for spacecraft separation. At about 57 and a half minutes, Centaur releases the spacecraft into a hyperbolic orbit, traveling at more than 41,000 kilometers or nearly 26,000 miles per hour on a seven-month cruise to Mars, where it will seek signs of ancient life on the red planet and collect rock and soil samples for possible return to Earth. So the vehicle is sitting atop its uh, launch platform in our vertical assembly or vertical integration facility right now. Processing has been going very smoothly for the last several days. So Atlas is go, Centaur is go, and we are literally chomping at the bit to take this nuclear-powered dune buggy out to Mars. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to go to Jessica Williams of the 45th Space Wing Weather Officer. Well, overall, the weather looks very favorable for launch Thursday morning. Today, we had a surface ridge of high pressure built into South Florida, and what this did for us is shift the weather pattern from last week so that we have southwest winds in the low levels in the mornings. That's offshore winds. And this pattern will persist through this weekend, so through the 48-hour backup window. So this gives us dry mornings with those offshore winds, but it does give us chances for showers and thunderstorms in the afternoon and evening. So if we look at our launch day forecast, the chart for the launch day forecast, we should have a 20% probability of violation for the cumulus cloud rule and the thick cloud layer rule. And this is really just due to a weak boundary being off the coast of the southeast. So we are expecting to see uh, isolated to a few scattered showers just offshore from Complex 41. But they will be moving very little or moving away from the pad. We have that slight chance of violating for the cumulus cloud rule. And there is also expected to be some mid-level clouds scattered to broken associated with this weak boundary off the coast. So we could see just a brief period of violating the thick cloud layer rule. But again, overall, it's only at a 20% violation for the overall two-hour window. So if we look at our 24-hour backup chart, again, we have offshore winds from the southwest in the morning, 8 to 10 knots. We have a 10% probability of violating for the cumulus cloud rule as that weak boundary off the coast of the southeast starts to diminish. And the chances for any cumulus clouds in the flight path over the water just off the coast reduce from the day before. And if we look at our 48-hour backup window for Saturday morning, uh, the weather still looks favorable with offshore winds from the southwest, or south from the west, really. They pick up a little bit, 12 knots with sustained um, gusts to 16 knots at 230 feet. Um, however, the upper level wind flow does change and become more from the east and stronger. So if we do see any showers or thunderstorms over the Gulf Stream, which is pretty typical for this time of year in the morning, uh, and if they do produce any anvil clouds, there's just a very slight possibility of those anvils reaching close to the coast. So that is why we have that 20% probability of violation for the attached and detached anvil cloud rules for the 48-hour backup day on Saturday morning. So again, overall, we're in a very favorable weather pattern for a morning launch time frame for Thursday through Saturday. Thank you so much, Jessica. Now we're going to start taking questions from reporters and social media. For reporters, please remember to press star one to ask your questions. And those online, you can use the hashtag Countdown to Mars. Our first question comes from Marsha Dunn of AP. Marsha? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Marsha. Yes, great. Um, I cannot remember so much company on the way to Mars as there is happening uh, this year. And I was wondering um, if either Mr. Kleinstein or um, Dr. Zerbuchen could comment on China and UAE on their way to Mars and how, whether there's any sense of competition um, and is the pressure on now that the world has two good launches off and you know, this is coming up third. Thanks. Sure, I'll start. Um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, we welcome more nations uh, taking trips to Mars and studying it and delivering the science and sharing the science with the world. That's 
what science is all about. And of course, it's a very uniting kind of thing. I, I honestly don't see this as a competition at all. Um, this is our ninth time to go to Mars and land softly and do robotic experiments and discovery. Um, and so we've been doing this now for decades uh, successfully. Um, and of course, uh, this mission is by far the most sophisticated mission ever. So um, I don't see it as a competition, but certainly we welcome more explorers to deliver more science than ever before. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing what it is that they're able to discover. Thanks. Space flight now. Stephen? And um, I think my question is from Matt Wallace. Uh, you mentioned you worked on uh, numerous rovers before, and you listed all the firsts on this mission. I'm curious if you could compare the complexity and risks associated with this mission with uh, Curiosity and previous missions. You know, everyone was kind of keyed up for Curiosity's landing back in 2012 with the seven minutes of terror. The sky crane was brand new. Just interested, given your experience base and your assessment of the risks and complexity of, of this mission overall compared to prior NASA rovers. Thanks. Uh, sure, yeah. The, from a complexity perspective, it's clearly a more sophisticated vehicle. As I said, we're, we're carrying about 50% more surface payload than Curiosity did, and that was by far the most complex thing we had ever done up until that time. Uh, so we're taking this a step further. And, and really the sampling system that we have on this vehicle, uh, because we are collecting um, rocks and soil samples that we ultimately want to bring back to to the earth and, and look for really trace chemical signatures from billions of years ago, you know, um, very faint signatures. Um, the system that we use to collect those samples has to be immensely clean. Uh, and so we had to sterilize it and we had to clean it from an organics and chemical perspective and we had to keep it that way from all the rest of the systems that, that uh, we had to use to get the, uh, the system to Mars. and so. Uh, that was, uh, from a complexity perspective, um, it was really a, a, another step uh, beyond what we did on, on Curiosity. Um, you know, from a risk perspective, I think one of the, still the highest risk portion of all of these missions um, is, is a landing process. You know, you mentioned it, the seven minutes of terror, there's really nothing we can do. Uh, we hit the we call it do EDL, do entry, descent, and landing. We literally send a command to the spacecraft <laughs> to, to, that's, that says that. And, uh, and then for the, you know, the spacecraft on its own has to get from uh, uh, out, uh, you know, outside the planet, moving at 12,000 miles an hour all the way down safely to the surface without any human interaction. And, and uh, it's basically a controlled disassembly <laughs> the whole way. Uh, it's by far the most complex or, or the most, um, uh, uh, the highest risk portion phase of the mission still. And uh, we have the good fortune on 2020 to have leveraged um, the, the system that we designed on, on Curiosity. And so uh, not only do we have all the testing behind us on this system that we did before we launched and landed Curiosity, we have the Curiosity flight itself and all the telemetry that came back. Uh, and it performed extremely well during that mission. Uh, and then we did a whole lot additional testing, you know, to, to launch uh, to launch the spacecraft. Still no guarantees, uh, you know, uh, our, our hearts will still be beating hard uh, when we get to that point of the mission. Um, but I do think um, uh, it's an advantage that we have. Uh, this is not a first time landing system uh, as we had on Curiosity. navigation of course if we landed with the curiosity system as it is we couldn't go to where we're going right that's right yeah I mentioned briefly uh, before that for the first time we're going to use a hazard avoidance system autonomous hazard avoidance system we call it terrain relative navigation uh, and it allows us to go to Jezero crater which is a very interesting scientific sites because it's got a lot of rocks and escarpments and sand dunes and uh, a lot of variation in the terrain and all those things are wonderful for scientists who are <laughs> looking for stratigraphy and other things, uh, but they all represent landing hazards for us. And so to get to a scientifically um, 
valuable site like Jezero, we had to develop a new uh, a new hazard avoidance system, and uh, and and we are flying that. It's it's a system that uh, essentially uses orbital imagery that we have from our other spacecraft. Um, we identify hazards on the surface. We mark those hazards on a map. We load that map on the, onto the spacecraft, and as we're coming down, uh, getting close to the planet, we take a picture. Uh, we find ourselves uh, in the hazard map that we've got on board, and then we divert away from the, the most significant hazards to the spacecraft. And so it does significantly improve our probability of landing in a, in a safe way. Uh, particularly in rough terrain at, at Jezero. This is a system that we've, we've tested extensively. Uh, Thomas, in particular, uh, wanted to make sure that, um, that, that we, had, uh, we had all of the necessary checks and balances and, and uh, rigorous reviews in place uh, for this system uh, before, we, uh, before we selected Jezero for, as a final destination. Uh, but we, we have exercised the system out in the desert with simulated landings. We have simulation, we have computer simulations, and it just works extremely well. It's a very powerful and robust system, and we have a lot of confidence in it. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jackie Goddard of the Times of London. Yes, hello, and maybe this question I think is for Matt. Um, adding the audio, um, is a, a, an interesting extra on this mission. And I wondered, what is the scientific significance of adding this extra sensory dimension to the mission? And at what point in the entry, descent, landing sequence does it kick in? Thank you. Uh, so we'll turn on the microphone pretty early in the process before we uh, deploy the parachute. And, and we should be able to hear uh, some of the spacecraft um, pyrotechnic events and separation events, uh, perhaps the, the, you know, the atmosphere um, at, at some level uh, interacting with the spacecraft itself. Um, uh, so we turn it on pretty early in the entry, descent, and landing system. Uh, the microphone we expect to survive landing and to also be usable uh, on the surface. It's a, we have two microphones, actually. I'm talking about a, a, a general uh, uh, a general engineering microphone now, and and we do think that that microphone will be able to hear our uh, big rotary percussive drill out on the end of the robot arm as it jackhammers its way into uh, into rocks, as well as um, the wheels crunching over the surface of Mars. Um, we think we'll be able to hear those things um, from an engineering. Um, Diagnostic perspective, uh, we're not quite sure, you know, how, how it will help us. That's something we're going to have to understand, I think, as we get some experience with it. There is a second microphone. It's mounted on the top of the mast, and it's associated with one of our instruments. Uh, the instrument is uh, called uh, SuperCam, and um, it's a laser breakdown spectrometer. Essentially, it fires a laser. And as the laser goes out, it creates a little plasma cloud with the rocks and the dust that it inter interacts with. And, uh, and you, when, we, when we fire this in our test beds uh, or in ATLO, you can hear it pop. You know, you can hear the zap almost. And uh, the science community is hoping with that targeted microphone up on the top of the, uh, the, top of the mast that they will learn something about the, um, uh, uh, about the composition of the um, of the things that the the laser is interacting with, uh, in particular, but it's a little bit of an experiment. You know, we haven't done this before. It's the first time we've taken this uh, this human sense to Mars and uh, and exercised it. So we're we're going to find out. I think we're going to learn as we go. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Jackie. Our next question is comes from Irene Klotz of Aviation Week. Thanks very much. Um, I think this is also for Matt. Have the repositioning of the uh, NASA three Mars orbiters already begun to be able to um, provide, I guess, as real-time comms as possible for the entry, descent, and landing? I'm not quite sure I heard the entire question, but I think it's related to the, the NASA orbiters and their, their support role for entry, descent, and landing uh, communications. Yeah, has, has that yeah, if that repositioning, if any, has already started or when you expect to do that and which orbiters will be used. 
So we're primarily going to use uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, uh, for entry, descent, and landing communications. Um, and uh, it has a minor amount of uh, repositioning, as you mentioned, uh, that will be required to, uh, so that it's exactly overhead when we land at Jezero Crater. And uh, I do not believe that that repositioning has, has quite started yet, but uh, uh, we've got plenty of time to get that done before we land. Thank you. We're going to take some questions from social media. Um, our first one comes from J.K. Um, Trudzinski. Um, what sort of data would Perseverance gather on the Martian surface? Let's take that. Perseverance gather on the uh, Mars surface. Well, we've yeah. talked a lot, I think, about the um, the, the science mission uh, of, of the project. And, uh, um, you know, uh, Thomas, did you want to well, go ahead and say know, a few first words? First of all, amazing question. That's why we're going there. Uh, I think the other thing I want to say there is that uh, a show right after this really focused on science with yeah. all details. But, you know, if you look back from, you know, look at the data that we're going to uh, gather, we, you talked about the, the weather instrument, kind of the, the, the meta that is standing there, and it's really a weather station uh, or right there in uh, Chesero Crater. Uh, you go uh, look at the uh, cameras. There's uh, uh, numerous cameras that there are. You talked about SuperCam. There's uh, there's another camera that is, uh, you know, from a point of view of uh, field of view and resolution, really quite unprecedented. Then you have uh, the instruments that are looking at uh, at uh, composition. You know, mm -hmm. some of them remotely, some of them by looking at samples and uh, really actually equipping us to gather the right samples to actually gather them and put them into these very clean sample tubes to bring back. You know, everything I would argue is set up for that to really get us that the ultimate data that we want to gather are these samples. I mean, to, for us, those are the most precious uh, samples uh, that uh, we believe we've had as humans in terms of uh, samples of nature uh, of uh, really answering this important question of astrobiology that yeah, the administrator talked about. That is uh, the ultimate uh, uh, you know, data, not only the sample itself, but the context in which this sample is collected. Uh, we learn from geology here, we learn from uh, the important analysis uh, in every environment uh, that, uh, that in fact, uh, that context is very important for the interpretation thereof. But I just want to block the session uh, later. What did I miss, Matt? No, I think you hit most of it. Uh, as, as Thomas said, we have very powerful spectrometers out on the end of the robot arm. Uh, we'll be able to look at the at the rock at a spatial resolution of 100 microns, which is tiny, and really understand from spot to spot, you know, how the chemical composition of the rock uh, changes. We've got spectrometers up on the top of the, the mast, which I mentioned, the super cam. We've got zoom cameras up there as well. We've got the weather station. Um, we also have a subsurface uh, radar sounder for the first time on the surface of Mars, which will help us understand contextually the geography of the landing site. Uh, that's the Norwegian provided uh, radar, which I mentioned before. Uh, so, um, so we have a very, very powerful suite of instruments uh, that will help us do exactly what Thomas said, which is find the right samples to collect. Uh, you know, we can't bring back a lot, you know, uh, uh, a lot of material when, when we bring uh, these samples back. And so we want to make sure we've gone to the right site. We want to make sure we've picked the right targets. And we want to make sure we understand uh, the context and the chemistry of, of those targets when we bring them back. So when you talk about what is the data that's coming back, um, you know, you mentioned spec, uh, spectroscopy, the idea that you can shoot energy into a material. Think of radio waves, or in this case, you know, it could be light waves or infrared waves, and then certain wavelengths bounce back and other wavelengths are absorbed. And based on that, we can make determinations as to the chemical composition of the materials. And here on Earth, what we have been studying is the chemical composition of materials where we know um, those chemical, that chemical composition was a result of ancient life here on Earth. So we're taking what we've learned from our own planet and we're applying it to another planet to make determinations as to whether or not there was maybe at one time biology. My, you know, we're talking about microbial kind of organisms on, on Mars. And, and then once we make that determination, 
we no kidding cache a sample. If we think it's a high probability that there could have been life in that place, we, we cache a sample so that one day, four years from now, or I should say uh, 2026, six years from now, we can bring it back uh, to Earth um, and, and study it and, and actually make a no, no kidding determination whether or not humans, um, or I should say Earth, is the only place uh, in our own solar system that, that has the capability of hosting life. And uh, that's, that's, I think, one of the most exciting things about this mission. So thank you, Bettina. And thank you all. Um, in many ways, you've answered our next question from social media. Ralph Bennett asks, why do we need another rover there? What more can we learn from Mars? Well, there's a lot. I'll let you guys. <laughs> I think it's precisely that. You know, kind of, uh, what's really interesting is like every time we build a rover and you send it there. We send it there. With it go a number of questions that we have. For example, spirit and opportunity. You talked about it, Matt, earlier. Or questions about water, the history of water uh, at the surface of Mars. So the entire instrument complement was laid out for that. Curiosity was about really trying to understand uh, the composition and are there any organics, right? Many questions. Uh, that were open and you know and really what we're learning from curiosity and there's surprises even today that the level of complexity in some of these um, uh, organics is much higher now it turns out the word complex means the more complex the more life kind of the more the likelihood to life so that's why that's a, such an important characteristic and so so now what what uh, perseverance is is really I would argue the first, and we've said it, uh, the administrator said it earlier, the first mission that really had at its core the question about life, uh, astrobiology, and therefore the instruments are very different um, uh, for that. And it's, it's I would argue, uh, very hard to imagine coming up with that instrument complement and that location without uh, the other uh, insights that we got from these other uh, uh, missions before, the ones I mentioned as well as... Uh, uh, others and so for us uh, it, it's a very different I mean it's you know in science when you peel back a layer it's not like an onion where the, the layer that comes from below it looks like the layer above it's a very different set of questions that are there and you know we're peeling back that onion and, and frankly going after a question that humans over millennia have asked and we're answering for the first time with the tools of science potentially the best way we can i mean for for me that's what it's about i mean that's i mean that question it's an old question like you go read old philosophers of the past the greeks the, wherever the culture is the people have asked those questions we're we're starting to address it with the instruments that are there that's the amazing part of it Exciting. we're going to go to another question from our reporters on the line mike wall of space.com Mike? Thank you all. Um, this one's probably, again, for, 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 yeah, for Matt. Um, like you mentioned, you had to pull off sort of like a magic trick with ingenuity to sort of make it fit. Could you go into a little more detail about what you needed to do and what, what the exact challenges were, were sort of posed by, by that additional payload? Thanks. Can I start this one if it's all right, Bettina? Um, so this is probably my fault, Matt, and I, and I, and I apologize. Uh, Thomas Zerbuchen brought this into the, into the administrator's suite uh, in my early days uh, as being the NASA administrator. And he, he had this, you know, this, you know, hey, what if we were to do this? And um, I, I loved it. Um, and I told Thomas, whatever you can do to make that happen, I'm all for it. And of course, Thomas uh, br brought that to you. And so I know it was uh, not easy to get done, but I will tell you, I, I sent a tweet about it wasn't called Ingenuity at the time, it was just called the Mars Helicopter, but I sent a tweet about it on like a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. And I didn't have a lot of Twitter followers at the time and I sent a tweet and it was like within, within an hour or two, there's 5,000 retweets. I mean, it just kind of caught fire and, everybody, and then all the media started covering. It was a very exciting moment. So anyway, I know it was difficult. Want you to know how much I appreciate all the work that you've done. So go ahead. I, I'll say I remember an all hands meeting where we were right after we were asked to try to accommodate the uh, the helicopter and you know some of the managers were, were kind of scratching their heads and and wondering how we were going to do this and I asked for a show of hands from our own team 
who would like to see the helicopter on on this mission? And pretty much every hand went up. So, you know, even the people that had to figure it out uh, were excited by uh, by the project. And and it was difficult. It's a very very unusual payload. You know, it's uh, it's very lightweight. You know, um, because it has to fly in this. Uh, very low density air. It's got these big, stiff carbon fiber blades uh, that sit out that have to be protected from the debris that we kick up, for instance, during entry, descent, and landing. Um, it's got legs that, that have to fold up and then have to be deployed out. Um, and, uh, you know, and we had to, we, you know, essentially the rover was full. The inside of the vehicle, which is where we have most of our uh, electronic systems to, so that we can keep them warm. Uh, that was full. The top of the vehicle was pretty much um, uh, overpopulated already, and so uh, and we had to we had to uh, come up with a, a way of uh, accommodating it. And ultimately, we decided to put it up under the belly of the the vehicle. Uh, it turns out that the belly pan is is a pretty separable thing. We kind of take that belly pan off. And we can give it to the team that was developing the accommodation engineering systems for the helicopter, and they, and they use some of our existing um, actuators and motors and, and things like that. We sort of hunted around for available uh, spare flight hardware uh, to figure out how we could do it and get it on the vehicle uh, in a way that one um, kept the helicopter safe, uh, and two allowed us to. Um, uh, deploy it off of the vehicle in a way that it wouldn't represent a risk or a threat uh, to the rest of the mission. We called it, uh, the objective essentially was do no harm to the primary mission because this was an extra technology experiment. Uh, and, and beyond that, our team was um, oversubscribed, you know, just with engineering challenges ourselves with the sampling system and the instruments. Uh, and so we made a we made a phone call, uh, and one of our system contractors, Lockheed Martin in Denver, stepped up to the plate. Uh, we provided them a basic design and some hardware, and some engineering support, and uh, we were able to figure out how to how to accommodate it underneath the vehicle. Uh, and then we went through a lot of testing to make sure, in fact, that um, that it would deploy, that it would stow appropriately, and that it would deploy safely on the surface of Mars. And then, of course, we still had to figure out how to operate it once we got it there. Uh, and I think we were working through those those opportunities uh, and, and those issues. So we'll be ready to go when it's time to fly the helicopter on Mars. But it wasn't easy. Fantastic. We're going to take our last question from Leo Enright of Irish Television. Leo? Thanks, Bettina. And uh, indeed, thank, thanks to Mike Wall Mike Wall Matt Wallace and uh, uh, and to Dr. Zabrukin for their wonderful uh, contributions. But my question is for the administrator. Um, Mars 2020 is basically Mars 2026. Um, and I'm going to ask a political question, which I think I can ask because I'm an ocean away, so nobody is going to think I've got an agenda. Um, a lot of your international partners will be wondering, will you be willing to continue to serve as NASA administrator, no matter who gets elected in November. Now, assuming, of course, that you're asked. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, my, my job right now is is to do these stunning achievements on behalf of the United States of America. And uh, look, I appreciate the question, but. Um, Look, I, I serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, I serve at the pleasure of the current president. And I think it's important that the next president have the, has the, the NASA administrator that, um, that, that, he, that he wants. Um, and um, the way the political system in the United States works, the NASA administrator is selected by the president. I think it's important. You have to have that relationship. Look at, look at what we're doing right now. We've got the Artemis program, which we, which we have reestablished that we're going to the moon sustainably, that we're going with a purpose to get to Mars. And because of that, um, we, we, we've, had, we've had really big budget requests. The President of the United States has put on the table the biggest budget that NASA has ever had in nominal dollars ever. Now, of course, in real dollars, Apollo was, was bigger. Uh, but we're heading the right direction. And, um, that's because the, the President of the United States trusts, trusts the NASA Administrator, and I would recommend to whoever the President is, at any point in time, pick a NASA Administrator that you trust to get the job done. Period. End of story. Um, and look, um, I've, I've had the time of my life in this job. I'm not going to lie. It's the greatest job I've ever had. 
uh, but I think there's a time when it's, it's somebody else's turn, and I am, I am under no illusions that I'm the only one capable of doing this job. So um, there's a lot of people that um, would be even better than me, and, and we'll leave it at that. So um, thank, you, thank you for the question. Thank you, Leo. Um, with that, we're going to end our questions, but we're going to turn it over to final remarks from NASA Administrator. Well, thank you, Bettina, and thank you uh, for the panel uh, participating in this today. What, uh, what an exciting time. Um, and I know we, we just had this conversation about ingenuity um, and the, the helicopter that's going to fly on Mars. I want to I kind of put it in perspective for a moment. Imagine looking from Perseverance out at a helicopter that is flying around Perseverance, and the helicopter is looking back at Perseverance, getting us images of Perseverance, what Perseverance is doing, we're going to be able to see with our own eyes, with motion pictures, these kind of activities happening on another world. Um, and, and I just can't tell you how excited I am about ingenuity and, of course, Perseverance, the first astrobiology mission. We shouldn't forget we're proving out that we can turn the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Mars into pure oxygen for life support because the president has given us agenda, an agenda to, to plant an American flag on Mars and, of course, to go with our international partners and our commercial partners, all of which is in uh, President Trump's Space Policy Directive 1. So we have this big agenda. This is a precursor mission, but it's also a scientific mission um, in its own right. Um, and there's so much more to discover, uh, and we're, we're so looking forward to it. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for paying attention. Um, if, you know, if you want to follow us, if you want to participate with us virtually from Thursday forward, uh, nasa.gov. I would encourage everybody to go to nasa.gov, and, um, and this is all about the next generation. We want to inspire people, so have your kids or your grandkids tune in. Uh, this is a great moment for not just the United States of America, but also for the world. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you so much for joining our conversation. The next briefing will be the Mars 2020 Science Briefing today at 3 p.m. And then at, we've mentioned launch coverage begins on Thursday at 7 a.m. and the launch is at 7.50. You can continue to talk about the greatness of this Mars Perseverance rover in Mars 2020 and Mars Ingenuity by joining us at Twitter and Facebook at Mars Perseverance and uh, hashtag Countdown to Mars. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.